Hello. Yes, things are a little different. <laughs> I figure since this particular video is long, <laughs> I want to do something different. We'll see how this goes. Now, this section of the video, what I want to do is pull the myth from fact, because what tends to happen when there's a movie or TV show or Broadway show that's centered around actual events, our fan theories, trivia, that sort of thing, or even the fictional side of it, we tend to latch on to. So what I wanted to do is take this opportunity to pull that, the, the sugar coating, Let, let's call it that, the sugar coating from the actual events and everything. So now the first thing that I want to tackle is Pulitzer because in the Broadway show, there is a character named Catherine, I guess she goes by the last name Plummer, Catherine Plummer. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing she's rebelling against she, her, her rich background and everything. Um, those of you who are fans of the Broadway show, I'm sure you'll tell me, but she's the daughter of Pulitzer. There have been fans of the Broadway show who have said that Pulitzer didn't have children or he didn't have a daughter named Catherine. That's not true. He had seven children. Two of them did not reach adulthood. One of them being Catherine Ethel Pulitzer. She died of pneumonia when she was two years old. Lucille Irma Pulitzer was 17 years old. She died of tuberculosis or typhoid fever. I can't remember. Um, now, Ralph Pulitzer, Joseph Jr. Pulitzer, and Herbert Pulitzer took over the business when their father died in 1911. Uh, Ralph basically took over altogether. He had the business sense. <laughs> now, when it came to uh, Constance Pulitzer and Edith Pulitzer, they married into uh, rich families. And they really weren't bothered by the fact that they didn't inherit the, the family business. No, they, they weren't bothered by it. They're like, let the boys have it. <laughs> and so, um, but from what I was also reading, uh, Ralph or Joseph, so it, it was passed on through grandsons of Joseph Pulitzer, I think even grandson, uh, great grandchildren. But yeah, the, the uh, family is still going strong. I mean, there are still living relatives of Joseph Pulitzer. So to say that he didn't have children, I no, <laughs> he did have a daughter named Catherine. She died when she was two years old. Now I, I will say, and, and this isn't centered around Newsies, this is just a, a problem that I have in general, is when there is a, um, character that is directly, it, it's not so much inspired by somebody in history or a person that actually lived, but it is that person and they didn't reach that age. So Catherine Plummer is a teenager or early twenties because she's mingling with the uh, newsies and she is a receptionist for her father I have a problem with that because the actual Catherine died when she was two years old. <laughs> but I've had a problem with that whenever I see it in general. So um, like uh, uh, Rudyard Kipling 
had a daughter named Josephine and, and she died when she was very young. I think she was five years old. And if they were to make a movie about Rudyard Kipling and his children and they showed Josephine in teenage years, again, I would have a problem with that because <laughs> she wasn't, she, she didn't reach that age. <laughs> so yeah, th that's, that's my only problem with it. And so, but no, Pulitzer had children, seven, uh, five of them reached adulthood and the family's still going strong. I believe that great grandchildren continued the, the business. Um, I'm sure to be corrected. I will double check on that, but uh, cause I'm, it's in my brain is morphing into Hearst's <laughs> newspaper firm as well. I, I got a lot of information up there and sometimes it goes up. Yeah. <laughs> it likes to mess with me. Anyway, so moving on from Pulitzer, let's look at the character Meta. Because <laughs> she she's uh, causing quite the controversy. <laughs> First thing I want to point out is Meta was made up. Okay, she didn't actually exist. It's possible that there was someone in vaudeville that was, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So, uh, vaudeville, I mean, uh, vaudeville, uh, the, the theater fans are really angry when they go and look at the movie version of Meta because the Broadway version of Meta is inspired by uh, Aida Overton Walker. Now I'm very familiar with her and her career because when I restored and colorized her husband, George Walker and uh, Burt Williams, uh, Williams and Walker, I became very familiar with not only their uh, routines and everything, I became familiar with her as well. So, and I, and I also came across a 78 record. So I have some recordings of Burt Williams and his satire music. So, <laughs> um, here's one thing to understand is, 20 years passed. I know it's actually 19, but I'm rounding up because <laughs> it was 2011 when the Broadway show was uh, performed at Playhouse. Um, so 19, 20 years had passed. Meta is Disney's personal creation. Okay, they can do whatever they want. All right, so they decided for the Broadway show, they were going to uh, throw in some history and uh, she was inspired by Aida Overton Walker. Okay, that's perfectly fine. They also changed the last name. I was a little, <laughs> I was a little confused by that because in the movie, it's Larkson. Broadway, it's Larkin. I, I was getting all kinds of confused with that so because I'm so used to the movie. I'm, I'm a movie fan, so. But um, there's a 20-year gap, okay? When they did the movie, please understand this. This is a thing that Hollywood does all the time. When they did the movie, they just decided, okay, we're doing a movie based on the Victorian era. Let's just throw in this vaudeville idea, this vaudeville concept. Well, they needed a name that could fill the seats. And uh, so they asked Anne Margaret. I mean, Anne Margaret is a big name. <laughs> so, so that's what they did. I mean, you, you look at the, the movie posters, Christian Bale was not a name yet. In 1992, he was not a name. The big movie that he did before was Empire of the Sun, and he was a little kid. I mean, <laughs> Christian Bale was not telling people about this movie because it was a musical. 
See, that was a big risk is that people were tired of musicals. They weren't, they didn't care about musicals. Animated movies were musicals. That was the whole thing. Little kids were going to these movies, singing the, the little songs and everything. Nobody wanted to go to, so yeah, for Christian Bale to not even tell his friends, I'm going to be in a musical, that should tell you everything. So they were using these big names like Robert Duvall, Bill Pullman, and Margaret. That, that was just the whole thing. They weren't using like the history aspect of it like they did with the Broadway show. So when you're coming over and you're looking at something from 20 years ago, well now, you know, 30 years ago, and you're getting all uptight and, and everything, don't be. <laughs> Another example would be with Star Wars. I, I've heard it from people who were teenagers, I mean, even my dad. And he talks about how people were sick of science fiction. So even George Lucas thought that this movie was going to bomb. So when you look at the movie poster from 1977, you see Peter Cushing, who is well known in the horror genre. And he really only has like two scenes in the entire movie. And then you see Alec Guinness, who was very well known, and John Williams. Well, John Williams was the composer. <laughs> for the music you don't see the top three names as being the three people who are running around on the death star this was like carrie fisher's big debut and nobody knew who carrie fisher really was <laughs> and uh, this the, that movie really thrust her into the spotlight so but but this is another example of that people musicals were dead and, and for Christian Bale to be like I, I'm, I'm not in a movie <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not doing anything <laughs> they were using the name and even on the VHS box that pink VHS box the names you see are Anne Margaret and Robert Duvall on, on the top but yet you see Christian Bale <laughs> So no, they were just using a name to, to fill the seat. They were using the, the vaudeville concert hall idea. And they just, they used Anne Margaret. People knew Anne Margaret. He, shoot, she danced with Elvis. So yeah, she, and um, 20 years later, they decided to add this historical twist to it. Uh, Meta is, and is inspired by uh, Ada. Overton Walker. So please understand that. <laughs> in 1992, they weren't using an inspiration. No, she's completely created by Disney. That's it. That that's that's the whole thing. <laughs> There's no. So when you come over and you're getting upset, don't be. <laughs> No, like I said, in Star Wars, Peter Cushing, who is in like two, three scenes, he, he was top billing on the poster, so. <laughs> uh, and, and so was John Williams. The composer was ab above the, yeah, the three kids that you saw running around in the Death Star. So moving on from Meta is the character Jack Kelly. Now, Jack Kelly is one that Disney said they created. This is their creation. There wasn't a newsboy who was named Jack Kelly. This is their own personal creation. And um, so they're, they're telling the movie side this, the movie fans this, but then you, you watch the Broadway show, they have this, uh, this uh, projection of the newsy banner because it, at some point in the story the the newsies make their own newspaper and it's called the newsy banner well in the movie they use a newspaper clipping and you see the name jack kelly spelled with two e's well this particular jack kelly shows up quite a bit <laughs> He does exist. 
but yet they they don't correct themselves at all so there there are people there are fans who are still adamant over the fact that jack kelly never existed but yet there's news okay so meadow was a creation as i said uh spot conlon was 100 percent created by disney <laughs> he did there are so many people who have blogs dedicated to the actual newsy strike and everything and they're asked questions about uh the 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 actual newsies and and that sort of thing and they're asked about spot conlin did he actually exist and but these people will say well yeah i saw uh articles and that sort of thing well then show the articles if you're not going to show the articles he didn't exist we're at a point where in you know <laughs> you, you got to show show the show it <laughs> because <laughs> be, before i i sat down to do this i decided to look on uh internet movie database and and go through and it turns out that internet movie database is uh somebody's going through i don't know if it's the fans or what have you because internet movie database is pretty much the movie version of wikipedia and uh they said that les jacobs was born in the 1880s well if you're trying to say that les jacobs is the brother the, the little brother of uh david jacobs well david jacobs was actually david simmons there was an actual david simmons he was actually a, a prize fighter at athletic clubs and everything a lot of them were, were fighters were boxers and that sort of thing but yeah dave simmons was second in command to kid blink which we'll get to him in, in a second but i mean i looked up the name les jacobs and it was a very popular name in the victorian era not just in america but in europe so if you're going to say les jacobs was born in the 1880s yeah i looked it up <laughs> there were a lot of them <laughs> it, it's it's uh same with uh francis sullivan they said that a francis sullivan was was born in the 1880s so are you saying that <laughs> because Les was like 10 years old in the movie, right? And and uh, Francis Sullivan was supposed to be, AKA Jack Kelly was supposed to be uh, 17. So seven years older than Les. And <laughs> so there's kind of a disconnect there, but there there were quite a few, Francis Sullivan's as well, same thing, a very popular name. There was a famous doctor, he died in the 40s here in America. He was he was a well-known doctor and his practice was in New York, but he also uh, practiced in Philadelphia. So he had like uh, two offices and he traveled. And, but, but Francis Sullivan was a popular name here and in Europe so as was sarah jacobs now the thing about sarah jacobs is it's also tied in with a very sad story i'm not really going to get into it but um there were uh in the 1860s what was known as fasting girls and her story is just tragic the the young girl's name was sarah jacobs so Sarah Jacobs is was a very common name. Again, that story happened in Wales. You know that that event happened in Wales. It's it's not a story. It's it's what actually happened with uh, Sarah Jacobs. So like here in America, there was another Sarah Jacobs that she <laughs> she sued her husband because they they went to uh you know it was like the gold rush 
and her husband claimed to have found gold and it turns out that she sued her husband because uh he lied to her <laughs> they, they didn't find gold and he lied to her because uh he knew well <laughs> It was, it was like this whole thing of he lied to her because she kept harassing him to find the gold. So he just figured if he told her that he, she'd get off his case. Well, then she kept wanting to see the gold. And finally he had to tell her, I didn't find gold. So then she uh she filed for divorce and she tried to file a lawsuit and the judge was like no <laughs> Just, you seem like a gold digger <laughs> i was almost like i was reading that and i was like i almost feel like this is where gold diggers started <laughs> oh gosh sometimes i read these stories and i just laugh because <laughs> So yeah, there 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 was that Sarah Jacobs in San Francisco and and everything. So so I mean, I go through and and I was investigating all of this after seeing Les and Francis Sullivan on Internet Movie Database and I mean, just saying that they were born in certain years, you got to elaborate. You can't just you you can't just say that. And just saying Spot Conlon you you saw well, well show us the articles <laughs> he's the one that disney made up i will elaborate okay i will prove because racetrack the actual racetrack his name was ed racetrack higgins and he was irish not italian <laughs> <laughs> as as we've grown accustomed to no he was irish and he lived in brooklyn and his trademark was red suspenders <laughs> however he was known for his uh speeches <laughs> dave simmons was known for his boring speeches yeah he was a very boring individual <laughs> poor david but uh ed higgins newspapers talked about how he had wonderful speeches at, like at the rallies and, and parades and everything and but he also referenced racetracks and horse racing and, <laughs> and everything else so when you look at it He's Irish, red suspenders, lives in Brooklyn. That, I, yeah, that's, that's Spot. <laughs> so, yeah, Spot is made up, but we still love him. <laughs> we protect him with our lives. Now, looking at Kid Blink, his real name was Louis Belletti. Well, his last name is in question, and I do want to point out that a lot of those kids did make up names, and it was to mess with the adults, you know, especially the cops. I mean, and with Kid Blink, because he was such a troublemaker, he, <laughs> we don't really know his last name, but we're pretty sure that it's Belletti. <laughs> he had red hair. and. I, for the life of me, I don't know why they, because, you know, I, I've been watching this movie since I was uh, 10 years old when it came out in 1992. And like, I, we didn't have any reference books at the library or anywhere else that pertain to, that, that centered around the strike. So I always thought that the strike leader was a kid by the name of Jack Kelly and until after I graduated high school. 
So I'm I'm just a little confused. I'm a lot confused as to why they didn't just stick with Kid Blink. <laughs> I don't know the reasoning behind that. I just don't. As for the the whole red hair thing, it's not really that big of a deal. I mean, one of his nicknames was Red Blink. Yeah, so he had, you know, it, kids don't change. Obviously, they had a nickname for him centered around a, a physical feature. So, <laughs> just like I always wore my hair when I used to have the really long hair, I wore my hair in a bun because I I was dancing all the time, and I was known as Bunhead. And then when the special edition Star Wars came out, they added Princess Bunhead. I was cosplaying as Princess Leia a lot. <laughs> Kids never change. And uh, so now, so those are the, the newsies for the most part. I mean, I didn't want to go down every single newsie. Uh, when it comes to the names, you know, like uh, Bumlets, Skittery, snitch they were taken from an illustration that was used next to an article in the 1880s about the slums of new york so um it's kind of accurate <laughs> and uh I can't tell you how many people have said what kind of a name is bumless i was like i, I don't know <laughs> <laughs> but there you go. <laughs> so moving on from the newsies, let's look at some of the, the locations. Uh, I know that the song King of New York is different from uh, the movie from the Broadway show. That tends to happen a lot. Look, I, I was a theater kid. I know how it works, okay? <laughs> I was a theater kid for 20 years. Um, in the movie version, it starts, a pair of new shoes with matching laces, a permanent box at Sheep's Head Races. And I have to be honest, for the longest time, I thought that that was just a fictional place and it was used for for the rhyme in the song. Well, <laughs> it's a real place. <laughs> it really existed. <laughs> uh, Sheep's Head Bay is, of course, in Brooklyn. And Sheep's Head Bay Racetrack was built on the site of where the Coney Island Jockey Club was. So there was this club <laughs> and they decided we want a racetrack. Now, as this was built, they would, they held uh, racetracks in other places. I'm not sure how that worked, but it did. <laughs> I, I'm I'm sure that uh, these gentlemen uh, paid a, a good amount of money to host these races, and at the same time they were saying, "Oh, by the way, when we're done with our racetrack, you come over and and all that." So it was finished in 1879. Their official first race. Their first day of racing was in 1880. Now they had uh, dirt and turf tracks. And there was like a half a mile, of course, for the turf tracks. And in 1886, their uh, one mile race course opened up their first turf course that was uh one mile now this caused a lot of debate because there were a lot of horse owners uh that were really concerned about 
that long, you know, racing for that long amount because there could be a pile up, there could be all sorts of issues that could happen. Um, they said, well, half a mile is fine, but for a full mile, it, it could, anything could happen. And, um, but in 1886, they ran this mile, no problems, and <laughs> everything was a success. Now, there are photos of people at this track, and they're actually sitting on the, the roof of this. I mean, this place was packed constantly. This place was popular. And, but in 1908, because this had to happen, the Hart Agnew bill was uh, passed and it banned racetrack betting in New York. And the fines, there were fines and a year in prison. So if, someone placed a bet at your facility, there was a fine, and the person who bet would go to jail for, or would go to prison for a year. And this caused a lot of problems. Be, because uh, horse racing was, popular. Like I said, I mean, there were people sitting on the roof to, to watch these racetracks. I mean, to watch these, uh, to watch these races. And then to suddenly be told you, you can't bet anymore and or anything like that. So, so the, the owners would be uh, fined for every bet, they could they could go into they they would have to file for bankruptcy or whatever. Two years later, an amendment was passed, and owners of the racetrack were liable for any betting done. It, it and it just the next year racetracks ceased operations altogether. So these facilities that were crowded, absolutely crowded, filled to capacity with people watching these races were now empty because of this. This was during a time where people were all of a sudden becoming uh, into this whole thing of, well, we need to be moral again. Uh, you know, this is immoral, we can't do it anymore. Betting on the horse race is bad. And, um, and pretty soon there was going to be uh, the the whole thing of you know drinking alcohol is is forbidden and all of that yeah it, this was uh so in 1913 the sheep's head bay was uh was sold for auto racing auto racing had become a new sport and i don't remember when uh nascar uh, the, the first NASCAR race was held, but it sounds about right, is uh, around 1913. Six years later, in 1919, it was torn down, you know, all because of that bill and amendment. So, yeah, it, it was a real place. For, for so long, I thought it was a fictional, <laughs> it was a fictional thing. Just something to throw in the movie for a racetrack to go to, but nah, it was real. <laughs>
Now the last one is so confusing. Okay, so here we go. We're gonna we're gonna <laughs> Irving Hall, the place where Meta, the place that Meta owns. Now when I started researching this, I didn't realize how many Irving Halls there were. There's New Irving Hall, there's Irving Concert Hall, there's this Irving Hall, that Irving Hall, Irving Place, Irving this, Irving that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Here's the thing to understand is Washington Irving uh, is a native of New York, he, uh, I believe Manhattan actually. But do you have to name every place <laughs> Irving? <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, I'm kind of, <laughs> oh good heavens. <laughs> oh. I mean, you're embracing it, but a little too much. <laughs> oh, good heavens. So, um, I mean, there, there was like an Irving Concert Hall in Brooklyn. There's the new Irving Hall. There's just regular Irving Hall. There, there was like two other places. I, I was getting so confused when I was going through this. Okay, so the Irving Concert Hall, in Brooklyn, uh, yeah, it, it was just a concert hall. <laughs> I think it also became like a, a music place. I guess it's still there uh, from what I was uh, reading. Now, the Irving, this is what's really irritating. Okay, if you look at like the encyclopedia sites and even <laughs> even Wikipedia, and it has a link to Irving Hall where the Newsies held their rally. They will show you this page of an Irving Hall where it turned into like a, a Amberg German theater and a Yiddish art theater and and that sort of thing. And and the the address will be uh, Irving Place and East Fifteenth Street. That's not the right place. <laughs> okay. Yes, it has a long history, and that's great, but that's not the right place. That's not where the newsies were. In fact, there are newspaper clippings that actually show where the newsies held their rally. It's New Irving Hall at Broom and Norfolk. Now, <laughs> I, I searched, I scoured, I looked everywhere to find out what happened to that Irving Hall, to the new Irving Hall. What happened to it? In 1907, there was a fire. It burned down. It's gone. <laughs> So, and uh, there, there were casualties, uh, I guess that it started at the back of the building and, and went through, uh, started in the kitchen. And uh, yeah, very sad, but it, it burned down it, it, in 1907. And so, <laughs> The, the Irving Hall that became a, a German theater and a Yiddish theater and, and a few other things. There was like a, at one time, you know, uh, in, in uh, the 30s, it, uh, an, an Italian gentleman took it over to show a, Italian films and everything. Now, that, that's not the Irving Hall where the Newsies held their rally. <laughs> no. Um, has a great history. I even found out that the uh, the organ that was in that theater 
in that Irving Hall still exists. It's in Rome. <laughs> I, I'm not sure what happened because there was an original building. I guess it got renovated or something because the organ was donated to a church. That church donated it to a, a, a church in Rome. So it still exists. I, <laughs> I'm guessing the, the first building was gutted and then it was renovated and that's how it became the German theater. So yeah, it has quite the history, but that's not the right place. <laughs> Broom and Norfolk, again, in 1907, it burned down. There was like a kitchen fire. There were casualties, very sad. But when you're linked to the other one that became the, the German theater and everything else. That's, that's not the right place. <laughs> and, and so, and, and again, there, there's also a concert hall, I guess it became a music theater and everything else over in Brooklyn and everything, but <laughs> I don't want you to get the wrong idea. I'm not saying not to embrace, especially when you have attachments to, a, a great writer like Washington Irving. I wish we had something cool like that. But so anyway, I just wanted to help uh, brush away the sugar coating because we all have our fan theories. We we all embrace the movie trivia and that sort of thing. And I just wanted to sit down and kind of pull apart all of that before we get into the actual uh, history and all of that. So let's move on to part two. So what exactly is a newsie? I mean, what's the definition? What is it? Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I hate to break it to you. They don't look like Jeremy Jordan or Christian Bale. <laughs> as much as we would like. <laughs> no, a, a newsie or newsboy or newsgirl is someone who distributes newspapers, a newspaper vendor, so to speak. When I was a kid, they were known as paper boys or paper girls. There was a, a game even. I used to play the game. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> of course, the game was really buggy too, but that that's beside the point. Now, many of us are led to believe that the concept of, of a newsie took off during the Industrial Revolution when uh, child labor uh, spawned and that's the best word for it. And a lot of these kids were thrown into uh, work, you know, like uh, in the factories and, and that sort of thing. They became sweatshop kids. But that's, that's not true. <laughs> in fact, you know, Ben Franklin had his uh, printing company. He was distributing the news. And so there were people who were distributing. Yeah, they were newsies. It doesn't matter what age you are. I think we've already established that. And uh, so even he was. <laughs> and uh, you also have to consider uh, there were what was known as the town crier. They were yelling the news everywhere. So they, they could be newsies too. And then also in ancient times, you had the soldiers that were coming out with the, uh, the scrolls and declaring what, you know, the latest whatever that that their ruler had to say, be it in ancient Egypt with Pharaoh or uh, with uh, Caesar and, uh, you know, or the emperor, I should say, not just, <laughs> and all that. So, you know, you go down in history and, and you look at it and you realize that, you know, we have a stereotypical look for Newsy which is, you know, the suspenders and the, the cap and and uh, the flannel looking shirt and or the, the shirt over uh, and 
but it goes further back. You know, we we call them a, a town crier, but they're they're announcing the news. <laughs> so yeah, it it didn't start with the Industrial Revolution and it didn't start with the invention of the printing press. It goes as far back as ancient times. I mean, the soldiers that were going around announcing this is what our ruler says. There you go. But what is interesting is with the Industrial Revolution, Newsies became very popular. Out of all the sweatshop kids, people latched on to Newsies. They became celebrities for for some reason. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's because of the fact that they were seen on street corners yelling the, you know, and because other kids, of course, were like uh, the assistant to a blacksmith. And uh, there were quite a few of those. There were oyster shuckers, uh, the mill workers. And, and all, so they were behind the scenes. Newsies were up front. And so I don't know if people, I don't know. I, I can't, I can only speculate, but there were a lot of advertisements with a newsie in it. There were like cigar advertisements for soap. There was even one that I saw for a stove. <laughs> There are uh, cards, uh, postcards. Uh, quite a few of them have uh, little poems on them. I have quite a few of them I've picked up in antique shops. One has a newsboy prayer. I, <laughs> I mean, it's in stage plays there were characters that were newsies. I, I found quite a few. Now there's a famous stage actress, her name is Maude Feely, and there was a play that she did and, and she's a newsie. And there's another uh, vaudeville play called The Hurdy Gurdy Girls. And somewhere along the lines, they are dressed as newsies. <laughs> um, there were quite a few people who over the years they would uh, put together bands for the Newsies it was like this whole charity thing and they would do special things for the Newsies you know like putting together these bands and as uh, musical thing for this and sometimes it was so that they could get their name thrust in the the newspaper be like look i did a good thing for these kids you know these uh, low class kids and other times it actually was they were doing something good uh, a lot of politicians and charity organizations did the same thing you know they would do uh dinners and events for the newsies usually the politicians did it around election time yeah it was very convenient there and with the charities, it was usually holiday. So a lot of Christmas dinners. There was a big summer picnic that happened. I don't remember who ran the, the summer picnic, but it was specifically for the Newsies. And um, I think that ran a couple of years. There's also, uh, there was also another one that ran at, in the winter time because there, the the newsies are throwing snowballs and everything so <laughs> that could have been a christmas one and they went outside to play so who knows but another thing is that there were quite a few uh books with newsies uh Hor horatio algers jr i'm sure i'm saying the last name wrong he had a lot of books that were about the street kids. So he had a lot of books with newsies in them. And so, yeah, a lot of books with 
the newsies, shoe shiners, mill workers, bell hops, and and everything. And Richard Harding Davis had one that was uh, Gallagher, the newsboy detective. And um, so yeah, there were there, there were quite a few of uh, the books during that time with these kids. So you know. <laughs> And I'm sure that these kids were not blind to it. <laughs> um, they drank it up, I'm sure. In fact, quite a few of these businesses, when, it, when these newsies would uh, sell in front of their building, I'm sure that these kids acted so pitiful and everything so that they could get a free show. because. I ran into so many articles where the they would talk about how well these newsies got a free show and and the newspaper gave them this free show you know or the you know like a concert hall gave them front row seats to see this show and all of this stuff and <laughs> there was one where it was a radio show let them see this show and everything yeah it was this it's like, oh my gosh. Like I'm pretty sure that these kids, once they realized their their celebrity status, they were milking it for all it was worth. <laughs> they weren't stupid. I mean, these are kids that had their own language. They messed with the cops so much. I mean, look kid blink got in trouble all the time there there were those kids that they were constantly getting into trouble it, it, it was just <laughs> it, it's it was just in their dna it was embedded into their dna but there were others that they they had a code you know their own spoken code their own spoken language and it annoyed the adults so much because they couldn't crack this code and and then the the fact that they would swap out their names all the time and that's one of the reasons why we don't actually know a kid blink's last name so <laughs> yeah i it's <laughs> so the fact that they were getting a lot of free stuff just for being uh, street kids, I'm I'm pretty sure that they <laughs> some things never change. <laughs> and, and well, why not? You can't fault them for that. Because <laughs> there's the other thing to understand is there were a lot of those kids who were on the streets. They would give these sob stories, like like to Lewis Hine and everything. Don't fall for those sob stories like there were some that would say that they were on the streets um and they were selling papers so that they could help their uh dying grandmother or their mom was just widowed you know their dad just died or something but then lewis Hyten would see him again and there was a whole other different story <laughs> it's like they didn't remember the story that they told <laughs> told him the last time and uh so <laughs> they but they had these sob stories so that they could sell their papers and that that was the whole point they they had these sad sad stories so that people would buy the, the newspapers like i i've read where one kid he had these bite marks on he probably gave the bite marks to himself for all i know and said that his dad gave him those bite marks because he didn't sell enough okay <laughs> there, there was a another one i've talked about him uh donald malik nickname happy and <laughs> yeah he, he was he was quite the kid well his the the money he made wasn't needed at home the job that his dad had uh they yeah i mean they were like middle class 
So there was no reason for, he just liked to, to be a rambunctious little kid. <laughs> so, and there were quite a few of those kids. Yeah, they, were, they just liked to run around on the streets. And uh, hey, if you can have that little bit of freedom, why not? <laughs> so yeah, don't believe every single story that you read about these kids because it was just a story um to sell the paper like the kid that said that his dad bit him <laughs> and uh, so yeah so th these newsies were used and they were like a part of pop culture you know like i've said in the 20s gangsters became part of pop culture and uh, you know, uh, former showgirls were on documentaries in the 90s and they were talking about how they threw themselves at the gangsters, even though they knew what they did. It was just, they were blinded by the uh, celebrity status that they had. And well, here's, for some reason, people latched onto these newsies, giving them everything, these little kids, giving them, using them in uh, stage plays, silent films. There are several silent films that they uh, are in and and everything else. Uh, there were songs, like I said, and, and all of that. So, and it was not, <laughs> the, the kids knew, they saw it <laughs> and they used it. <laughs> now, as for the strike of 1899, what, I mean, when you're a, a celebrity, basically, when, when you're part of pop culture and everything like that, why would you go on strike like that? Why would you suddenly snap? What, what made you do that? <laughs> Don't forget these kids are still child labor the city depended on them. That's one of the, I'm sure that that's one of the reasons why they were throwing everything at them, everything in the kitchen sink. And so, but this wasn't a sudden thing. The, the 1899 strike was not just a sudden thing. There were other strikes that happened. I mean, it was like, Every other year, there was a newsy strike. There were also trolley strikes that were happening ever since the invention of electricity. And they were replacing a lot of things with electricity. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it's like, we're going to use electricity now. And when it came to uh, trolleys, they were basically saying, well, we're going to use this invention now. You're, you're no longer needed. We're, we don't need the workers anymore. <laughs> it was just like the worst decision ever. So the, the problem with that is that with the trolley strikes, they became extremely violent. Uh, there was one in 1895 that was just horrendous. Uh, the, the police came in, there was, I think uh, the militia came in and a lot of people lost their lives in, in this particular one. But, and, and the, the trolley strikes continued into the twenties. I've seen pictures where trolleys were overturned, set on fire and, and everything. So, and, when it came to newsy strikes, they went as far back as like the 1850s. The other thing to understand is there were people who were protesting the fact that that child labor was a thing. I mean, not just newsies, but child labor in general. They were like, kids deserve to have a childhood. They should be getting an education. And uh, they, they shouldn't be in the factories. That's not their job. They need to be. and. So, but then the children uh, started getting in on that as well. Um, there was one in Detroit that was like in 1886. 
because a lot of them are not documented, but in the 1880s is when we really start to see it escalate. And so there was a, a Detroit strike in 1886, and it was always about money and and pretty much they 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 intimidated they didn't really get violent and uh with the 1886 it was like uh they demanded two uh newspaper copies for 1 cent so two for one <laughs> So then in 1888, there was a Dallas Newsboy strike. And then in 1892 was a Christmas dinner. <laughs> um, which I don't know why that's with the, the strike timeline, but it is. <laughs> But 102 newsboys were invited to that. That's one of the most uh, famous Christmas dinners. And uh, because that's where a, a Toledo Newsboys Association was formed. And, uh, and then in 1894, the Boston Newsies boycott the Herald and Globe. So two newspaper firms in Boston were boycotted by the newsies. They, they were not going to sell anything until the managers of those newspapers reduced the price from one and one and a quarter cent to one cent. And uh, there was also a, a Brooklyn uh, strike, which basically they just went in and intimidated everybody. <laughs> nothing really happened uh yeah they were just like you need to lower the price it's always lowering the price you know the prices because these are these are poor kids you know these kids are barely scraping by it's like what they make that day is what they've got you know so um When you take into consideration the fact that these kids are selling these papers that show news like this, you know, the, the trolley strike and everything. I mean, with the, with the trolley strike, here's a new invention, electricity, and these strikers are saying, no, you need us. You don't, you don't need this newfangled thing. And... <laughs> You need us, and so they're they're going up against uh, progress, and they also see where fellow newsies are going up against other uh, newspaper firms. Well, of course, when it happens to them, finally, it's not that they snapped; it's that they decided, why why not us? We could do the same thing. Of course, it was Pulitzer and Hearst, the most powerful men. <laughs> that could be a little intimidating, but I mean, when you see, when, when you're selling these papers littered with news about trolley strikes and uh, strikes and, and other strikes with fellow newsies and everything and all these other people are doing it and and all that and making a statement it happens to you and you just stand by and let it happen why would you do that <laughs> and no <laughs> no you would not so So yeah, I, you know, and especially when you're a celebrity status, I mean, Joseph Pulitzer needed to be told off. I mean, <laughs> come on now. <laughs>
I mean, I can make the jokes all, all I want, but you know, the truth of the matter is, is, you know, there's, there's different songs about these kids and, and, um, and stage plays of politicians and charities, uh, and, and, and all of that. And, and the, the advertisements with newsboys and everything. So they, they were using these kids and, and they were, they were taking it and <laughs> they weren't blind to being used and they were taking the charity. And with all of that in mind, Pulitzer, the most powerful man in New York City, uh, when he decides to lower the price of his papers for his, I mean, the Newsies were his employees. That's just the bottom line. And I say that with all of these kids, you know, and when they decide to do that. And you know, we the, the Brooklyn Newsies, the Boston Newsies, the, the Detroit Newsies, everything else, the Dallas Newsies. Those Newsies are employees. So when you only lower the price for them and not everybody else, that is a shit move. <laughs> okay. You, if you're going to lower the price for them, you got to lower the price for everybody. Because if it weren't for them distributing the paper, where would you be? I mean, it, it would still be sitting in the warehouse, right? That, that's the whole bottom line of it. And they knew that. They had to know that. These kids had to know that. You know, they, <laughs> it, yeah. So, So pretty much <laughs> a newsy distributes newspaper. They've, you know, you go as far back as ancient times, you know, just telling what the emperor, you know, declaring emperor's news or pharaoh's news or whatever. It didn't start with the printing press. You know, the, these newsies, and we, we have to remove the stereotypical look of what a newsy is. Think also of, what, you know, a soldier with the scroll looking at, yeah, that could be a newsy too. And um, <laughs> in my day, they were called Paperboy and I loved that game. <laughs> Never got through it. <laughs> oh, goodness. And, but the newsies popularity rose in the industrial revolution with child labor. There were people protesting child labor said that the kids needed to be in school and they needed to have a childhood. And uh, so I also, I don't know if I said this, but I also believe that with these people protesting that also uh, fueled the, the kids uh, going on strike as well. They're, you know, you never know exactly. I mean, I'm sure that it was also the, the prices, but with people supporting them in that way, yeah. It could be a number of things. Kids were using advertisements and all sorts of things. Politicians used them, you know, towards election years. There were uh, all kinds of different things. Uh, people also set up musical bands and all of that. Look, the kids weren't blind to it. They were drinking it up. <laughs> they, they, yeah. I, and and also, uh, I mean, the fact that they had their own secret language to to mess with the cops and the adults and everything else, they were switching out their names. They were rowdy kids. They were rebellious kids. Uh, kids don't change. Kids do that now. We were doing that. Uh, us emo kids were doing that. I mean, <laughs> good golly. Don't I look so surprised? And uh, so, and... As for the strike of 1899, it, <laughs> um, the fact that it happened to Joseph Pulitzer is the reason that it was such a shock. The other ones, uh, 
you know, like uh, the the one in Boston, the one in Brooklyn is like, okay, uh, you know, all right. But, and, and there's a lot of strikes that weren't documented at all. It was like, it was whatever. But the fact that these kids went up against Joseph Pulitzer uh, is the reason why it's, so famous, you know, considered the most famous strike ever. And, and then of course, you know, the, they, they saw all of those articles on other newsy strikes, trolley strikes, and everything else. And, um, and, and I think it's very telling when they started off violent, much like the trolley workers, and then decided we can't be violent anymore. We got to stop. So, that tells me that they were starting like the trolley workers and then quit because there was a trolley strike going on the same time as this strike and uh not as violent as the 1895 strike but still i mean <laughs> i've seen so many pictures of trolley strikes where they're putting things they chopped down a tree and put a put the tree on the the tracks and everything yeah they just they do all sorts of weird stuff but so anyway on to part three Before we go any further, we have to talk about Joseph Pulitzer, <laughs> because, of course, he's the reason why we still talk about the Newsy strike today. <laughs> now, if we were to use video game terms, he is the final boss. <laughs> While a lot of people consider him corrupt and just an awful human being. You know, he was terrible to the kids and everything. I have kind of a soft spot for Joseph Pulitzer. So what we're gonna do is we're going to look briefly at his younger years and then work up to his journalism years. So um, he was born April 10th, 1847 in uh, Mako, Hungary. I'm sorry if I'm saying that incorrectly. <laughs> In a Jewish community, his father was a successful merchant. I have seen uh, several different of what exactly his father did. So I'm not going to say exactly. <laughs> I just know he was a merchant and he was successful. In fact, he was uh, rich enough to retire. Um, Joseph and his siblings went to uh, private schools, they had private tutors, so they were well educated. Um, they spoke French and German. His father died when Joseph was only 11 years old. This left the family penniless uh, because with his father not there, the, the business crumbled. His mother did remarry there's not much that I could find concerning how the family uh, functioned due to the uh, due to this new husband and everything. I just know that uh, Pulitzer decided that at the age of 17, he was going to enlist in the army because that brought in uh, money. So um, he tried the Austrian army, and then he tried the British army. He also tried the French Foreign Legion. He was rejected by all of them. Understand that he was scrawny. <laughs> that was the word used. He was a scrawny youth. He also had health problems even as a young man. 
and it followed him throughout his life. And so, but in Hamburg, Germany, he was enlisted to fight in the U.S. Civil War with the Union Army. When he arrived in Boston in 1864, however, he changed his mind. Now, again, he didn't speak English at this time. So when he came over, he realized that his enlistment money would be kept by the recruitment office. With that in mind, he uh, unlisted, <laughs> went to New York, and then enlisted. Um, and he was with a, um, a regiment of, that was completely made of, this is terrible wording and I'm very sorry, but his regiment was German immigrants. It was completely made of German immigrants. And again, I'm sorry for the wording. Um, so he didn't learn to speak English until after the war. He, very little English uh, was. And so when the war ended, he was impoverished. Now, this is something that happened after the Civil War, is uh, the, the veterans were scrambling to find jobs. It, it's not like what it is now, where um, uh, veterans are helped. It wasn't like that. In fact, they weren't even paid. And um, so Pulitzer was on the streets. He was homeless. A lot of times there, there was, uh, I did see at times that he was sleeping in wagons on the street side. And uh, so he moved to St. Louis and he took on different jobs such as like he, uh, when he was trying to uh, take the ferry, he uh, um, shoveled coal, and that was the payment. <laughs> was, and he also, he was like a deckhand. He was a hack driver. During the uh, 1866 uh, cholera, I think it was cholera epidemic, he was a grave digger. He was also a waiter. And he also, he said like the worst what Pulitzer himself said that the worst job he ever had was taking care of mules. <laughs> and uh, he also uh, wrote reports for Atlantic and Pacific Railroad. That's how he uh, got into law and politics. And, uh, but the problem with, with law was that he tried to get further into law, but early was his accent and broken English drove clients away. They couldn't understand him. It, it, it was still a problem. <laughs> so he, um, he got a job as a journal you know and as a journalist he actually wrote an article about this scam that was going on with a ferry i believe it was a ferry and they liked it so much you know they caught the scam going on this fraud deal going on and so they kept him on well um then Basically, he was, he wanted to uh, write investigative work. And so he was um, wanting to bring out the truth. Well, <laughs> in 1870, it got him in, into a bit of trouble. 
<laughs> because a man by the name of Captain Edward Augustine, who was a building contractor and also the supervisor of registration in St. Louis County, uh, was accused of being corrupt and by Pulitzer and so he went back to Pulitzer and told Pulitzer he was a liar he said no you're, you're full of it and uh, it turned into an altercation um, where Captain Edward actually punched Pulitzer and Pulitzer shot him in the leg and uh, Pulitzer pled guilty and had to pay a fine. Um, after that, he sold his interest in a Westlake Post, which is the um, where he had been working, and he had met all these politicians and everything and <laughs> and uh, they one of his nicknames well he had two nicknames uh, he was nicknamed joey the german and also joey the jew and uh but then in 1878 he married uh catherine davis uh, she was a distant relative to Jefferson Davis, who um, is like the uh, president of the union. Now, she was of a Episcopalian faith. And he kept his Jewish faith secret. In fact, they had a wedding and it was an Episcopalian we uh, wedding and everything. And <laughs> after the marriage, it was like all of a sudden he told her, oh, yeah, I'm Jewish. I can only imagine what that was like. <laughs> she, I'm sure she was very shocked, but they stayed married until he died. So, <laughs> and, and they, again, they had seven kids together. So, and that same year, he bought two newspaper firms. Uh, one was the St. Louis Post. The other one was St. Uh, Louis Dispatch. And he brought them together. And for a while, it was the St. Louis Post and Dispatch. And then he shortened it. And it was uh, St. Louis Post Dispatch. And from what I understand, it's, uh, it's still going. So, and he grew it from four pages to eight pages. Hard to believe that <laughs> newspapers were only four pages. <laughs> Especially when you think of Sunday editions where they're like <laughs> big old rolls. Oh, good heavens. Now he used this newspaper again, to expose corruption, such as like tax evaders, gambling rings, insurance fraud, and all other kinds of city corruption. Now, with this, of course, he made a lot of enemies. And, uh, but the paper was a huge success. And if it's, <laughs> and if it's still going, I mean, that's even better. Now, there was a snag because in 1882, there was a murder. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Alonzo Slayback, he was a, a political, he was running for election. Uh, he was a nominee. And one of the editors called him a coward because of something that happened. And uh, I, I wasn't uh, quite clear what was going on. I guess at the election, a meeting or something there was something that happened and and Alonzo had uh, walked away or something to that effect it, it didn't make much sense to me as to what had happened at this election meeting 
but either way, the editor had called him out and called him a coward. So Alonzo just stormed into post ditch batch with a gun and the editor pulled out his own gun and, and shot him there. Well, it, it was, a. Uh, of course it was all over about what happened, but Pulitzer defended his editor and he lost a lot of readers because of that. Well, Pulitzer decided that he needed to move on and the next year he uh, moved to New York. Now he did, um, he gave full control to his partner for, um, for St. Louis uh, Post-Dispatch. Um, at this time, his health was declining. I mean, we're, uh, we're looking at the 1880s and we're pulling into the 1890s. Um, he's, he's reaching his eccentric uh, attitude and I'm not sure attitude would be the word, but he's hard of hearing. His nerves are very fragile. In fact, he would have soundproof rooms and I mean, he was just very sensitive to to sound and and that sort of thing. And by the 1890s, he was nearly blind or just blind altogether. It seems like I, I remember reading that he uh, uh, suffered a, a, a blood vessel popping or something or something to that, something terrible like that. So with that in mind, <laughs> 1883 rolls around the next year after that, you know, after Alonzo scandal. Uh, so he bought the New York world, you know, and he moved his family to New York. Now, this particular newspaper was actually dying. Uh, the person that had it before was running it into the ground. And uh, so <laughs> Joseph actually revived it and saved it. Um, he, he built a 16-story building, which was the tallest in 1890 by the time it was finished. And uh, he once again with his newspaper, wanted to find the truth with his newspaper, just like he did in St. Louis. And uh, he was really proud of the fact that his newspaper helped to elect Grover Cleveland. Um, there was also the fact that his readers helped to raise enough money for the Statue of Liberty pedestal. So yeah, there's something to be proud about. <laughs> Now, he also hired Nellie Bly. Uh, there's uh, an entire thing that's uh, around the world in 82 days. That was their whole thing. <laughs> she did a lot of investigative journalism, just like he did. She went around the slums and institutions and, and got the truth that way. She, she did a lot of stunts and um, people loved it. People loved her reporting as well and um so then you get to the yellow journalism okay so this is where people really uh, nowadays see him as a problem you know they turn away from him and they're just like this this guy <laughs> So he was in competition with Hearst, William Randolph Hearst. And um, again, uh, you know, uh, Pulitzer is his failing health and, and everything else. You got to understand that. 
but he he's a businessman he, he's in competition also one thing to also remember is that his father his his father's company crumbled once his father died and so and and that left him and his family penniless okay he's already been on the streets twice and he doesn't want that to happen again plus he's got children of his own and he 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 doesn't want them or his wife on the streets like he was i'm i'm sure that eats at him all the time and uh and of course at the same time he's competing with with this this whippersnapper <laughs> <laughs> this yeah william randolph hearst and so you got this yellow journalism that's going around and all it is is sensational headlines and and improving the truth look if you've seen newsies they talk about it. you got you see the kids and they are em embellishing the headlines and and everything else that happened all the time the, the kids did it you know the newsies did it they would go through the paper they did anything to sell these papers and and there's a line in the movie where uh jack even says i i don't do anything the writers don't do you know <laughs> he's not wrong <laughs> so yes uh i mean this this made joe pulitzer millions of dollars and and it made hearst millions of dollars too and it, it, people weren't blind to it. They knew what was good. People made political cartoons about it all the time. And I think there was a, a, uh, a cartoon strip about it as well, uh, about uh, the yellow journalism between these two uh, fellows. And the other one was mudslinging. And mudslinging was in, uh when i when i was in school we talked about mudslinging and it showed up a lot during the uh um election time between these two fellas uh between pulitzer and hearst and it's it's basically just you know uh arguing and 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 saying all kinds of insults back and forth that's all it is and so i mean when we've seen a political debate that's pretty much what's going on isn't it <laughs> but you you add the yellow journalism on top of that and it's just oh my gosh how did these people even <laughs> so yeah um so that, yes. <laughs> so when, when you take all this into consideration, uh, you, with the, the yellow journalism, you know, hi hiring Nellie Bly and, you know, her uh, creative journalism and, and the competitiveness with Hearst and and the mud slinging and <laughs> he started out right i mean he wanted to get the truth out and he had a couple hiccups you know he he probably shouldn't have um uh taken the side of his editor when that editor went up against alonzo and everything yeah that i mean how how are you supposed to take that I, you know well actually i i do know i don't know why i'm questioning it he probably should have fired the editor because murder's not okay <laughs> never okay never okay at all so yeah he he didn't choose wisely on that sense but um you know here here's a guy who 
he came into this country. He, he couldn't uh, speak the language. And he took on so many jobs <laughs> trying to learn the language. He wanted to, to study law. He couldn't because he, he had broken English. You know, there were so many things that he wanted to do and everything. So, and then he finally steps into something that he's good at. And then you got Hearst that's knocking at his door and everything. So, and then once the strike happened in 1899, by this point, he was a frail old man. Um, Pulitzer had lost his eyesight. Uh, he was suffering from insomnia. He was a diabetic. Uh, he was suffering from asthma and rheumatism. His workers had to help him through the day. Uh, he was just so, um, in front, I mean, he would be there at work and people had to help him throughout um, and, and everything. But, um, so when the strike happened, uh, you know, he, he was, he was a sick old man and everything, but he was a businessman. He was still a businessman. And you have all these other instances, as I said in the last part, where the, you know, like with the, the Brooklyn strike and, and the Boston protests, you know, or the, the, they went up against the two, you know, the Boston Globe and the Boston Herald and all of them where they were raising the price for the newsies. Well, he was just doing the same as everyone else. You know, he was just raising the price as everyone else. He was a businessman. That's what he did. And, um, I'm pretty sure he really didn't believe he had no idea that this was going to happen and that these, that these kids were going to come up against it. Cause he was Joseph Pulitzer. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't going to happen. No, they, they weren't going to do that. He was, he was Joseph Pulitzer. <laughs> and so that's one of the reasons why I have a soft spot for Pulitzer is because of the fact that he had uh, failing health from the time that he was young. He, he was a very young man and it followed him up until he, uh, he died and, and, uh, on October 29th, 1911. In fact, his son took over in 1907, completely took over in 1907. Um, I do want to say, uh, that the world, uh, fell apart in 1931. So, um, just to be clear, cause it's, I know that I said that it seems like the, it went through grandchildren and great grandchildren, but no, it, it cause it, it, it didn't. <laughs> so anyway, um, that's, that's Joseph Pulitzer in a nutshell. Uh, he started off with right intentions and then the, the whole idea with yellow journalism and sensational headlines and everything, and uh, it, it sold the papers and it, it made him a millionaire and and all of that but it, also his competition with Hearst he just forgot his way he he lost his whole idea of what it was he was doing with his newspaper and everything and also he was just he was a very frail uh man <laughs> and um does it excuse what he did no no, it does not. 
he, he was a businessman and he was doing what the other papers did as well. And um, that's just the way of it. <laughs> I can't fault the guy for being a businessman and doing the same thing as what other businesses did before him. You know, that, that's, but I th truly believe that in his mind, he thought, well, I am Joseph Pulitzer. I am the most powerful man in New York City. Nobody's going to come up against me. And uh, so, but anyway, on to part four. We, of course, have to look at the other mastermind behind all this because Pulitzer didn't exactly act alone. <laughs> there was also William Randolph Hearst. Now, I'm not going to go into his entire life story because, of course, William Randolph Hearst was much younger. <laughs> he was born on April 29th, 1863. And of course, the next year, Pulitzer arrived in, in America. So that should give you a clue as to how <laughs> the age difference between these two men. So yeah, 1863 was when he was born. He was born into money. His father was a millionaire. Now, he, of course, went to college, Harvard College. Uh, he was expelled for uh, antics. <laughs> yeah, he was a spoiled rich kid. <laughs> That's, this is the bottom line. However, it does say that he, he graduated. So, um, class of 1885. And... Um, Two years later, in 1887, he took over his father's business, the San Francisco Examiner, and he received the best equipment and the best writers. Of course, during that time, uh, when you were a writer, so say, like, uh, for instance, Mark Twain, Jack London, even uh, uh, Jules Verne, and... Um, Conan Doyle, you would send your writings to a magazine or a newspaper. They would be released in episodes. And so in the case of William Randolph Hearst, he had Mark Twain and Jack London. Those were the two big names that he had um, that I saw anyway. There were like three other names that and I didn't know who they were. So but <laughs> these were the recognizable names, but so again, so he, he has, he inherited it at his dad's business and receives all the best of everything. <laughs> the total opposite of Joseph Pulitzer. <laughs> who had to, uh, and and by this point, Pulitzer had gone through several different jobs, and he had already built up the, or he had worked in the business and and everything. And uh, yeah, he was nestled in uh, in the paper business already over in St. Louis. Well, of course, Hearst wanted a bigger piece of the pie. So he, he wanted to move on to something bigger. With the financial support of his mother, 
his father had died in 1891 so his mother was a widow his mother financed this decision he bought the new york journal now the new york journal was floundering i mean it was dying so just like uh pulitzer with the world uh hearst did the same thing i mean <laughs> it's <laughs> And he hired big names again, like uh, Stephen Crane. Uh, Stephen Crane wrote Red Badge of Courage. He wrote a lot of uh, uh, wartime stories. And uh, his poetry is very dark, uh, very apocalyptic, <laughs> everything, but, but a great writer. Um, and of course, this is where we see the war with Pulitzer. I mean, it was like he latched onto Pulitzer. <laughs> but you have to. Uh, and of course, in the 1890s, Pulitzer is like blind. And uh, I mean, his, his his health is failing. And, <laughs> and. And that's another thing to consider. Well, so. their their uh, yellow journalism fight is happening and everything well the the spanish american war really helped hearst's paper sales because there was what really set off america going into war was uh the sinking of the ship the main and it, it exploded and hearst had a field day with it if, in fact there was a headline that said remember the main to hell with spain of course when i was a kid i heard it remember the main down with spain <laughs> and that was the cry that everybody said there was such outrage against spain and so these they they were going to war they they wanted they were going to avenge what happened i think to this i'm not sure i tried to find information on it but i think to this day nobody really knows what happened to to the main but um uh hearst just pointed the fingers at Spain and basically fueled that whole thing and um, with no evidence. So really, nothing has changed. How many times have we seen that happen? I mean, we just had a trial where no evidence, but people were on board with somebody's side. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh yeah, no evidence. Yeah, <laughs> might want to check. Step back, Sherlock senses. And, um, but everybody was completely outraged. They were saying the cry, the remember the main and all that. Their fight against each other, their papers were known as yellow papers. And when you look at, uh, I mean, even the, the newsies, were calling them yellow paper you know when they were going through the strike uh, uh they were talking about tearing up the yellow papers we don't want any of these yellow papers and so when you see that phrase it's because of the yellow journalism so th these kids were very aware of what they were selling <laughs> and um so uh, yeah, there. The the fight between Pulitzer and Hearst, the, the the competition between Pulitzer and Hearst was insane. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure that there's somebody on YouTube who has done an entire series on it. It's just, I don't think there's any 
nobody else who could top that. Um, just, <laughs> I mean, you have this gentleman, Pulitzer is, his his health is failing him, and you have this guy who who comes up. Um, I don't know, you know, this young rich whippersnapper comes out, <laughs> comes out of nowhere, and, and Pulitzer's like, "I'm going to get this guy," and and Hearst <laughs> is like, "Bring it on, old man." <laughs> How else can you describe it? That's pretty much what was happening, and. Even when Pulitzer was long gone, you know, he, he passed away in, in 1911, Hearst continued the yellow journalism, and, and it got, I mean, he had nobody to compete with, really, and he was, his, his headlines got really, really bad, and um, I mean, he, he did, I'm not sure if they were really, that bad for the Lusitania. I think he held back for the Lusitania, for the sinking of the Lusitania. But um, of course, we all know that he demonized uh, Bruce Ismay. I mean, he didn't hold back when it came to the Titanic. And then, of course, there was the scandal for Roscoe Arbuckle. He didn't hold back with that. And I mean, it's just you continue to look at a lot of the other uh events where he just he couldn't stop himself this is what he knew now i mean <laughs> this is what we're doing <laughs> so but he eventually passed away in 1920 i mean in uh, 1951 and um so but yeah i mean yellow journalism was basically his calling card at that point and he continued to do it long after Pulitzer was gone he had nobody to compete with but he was uh, the, the sensationalism was what he knew but um <laughs> yeah he was he was a spoiled rich guy he uh came up in the newspaper industry uh he took over his dad's business and he was given everything and um so, uh, you know, I don't really have any sympathy for Hearst like I did for Pulitzer because for him to raise the price for the Newsies was uh, pretty much a dick move. <laughs> I could say that he was a businessman, but no, he was just a spoiled rich brat doing it to, to say, look what I can do. And, uh, and you know, laugh in their face. And, oh, you, you won't hurt me, you know? <laughs> and, uh, but he, he had to step down off of his little pedestal because he was losing money. So it, it bit him in the ass. <laughs> so anyway, on to part five. So now let's talk about the strike itself. <laughs> the strike of 1899, the reason that a movie happened and a Broadway show. So the interesting thing about this is it actually had to do with the Spanish-American War that happened a year earlier. 
And again, it has to do with money. <laughs> I mean, these were broke kids. So uh, originally, these uh, newspapers, the uh, newspaper firms would charge them 50 cents for a bundle of 100 papers. Well, when the Spanish-American War was going on, they raised the prices to 60 cents for a bundle. Well, the Newsies really didn't mind that because the public was eating up this war. This was one of those uh, news stories where they were selling like crazy. So it wasn't that big of a deal that they raised the price, that Pulitzer and Hearst raised the prices. But once the war was over, then it was a problem. <laughs> <laughs> then it was like, wait a second, <laughs> wait a second here. Um, most of the publishers dropped back to 50 cents. Well, Pulitzer and Hearst didn't because again, they were competing with each other. <laughs> and they refused to, to drop the price. They kept it at 60 cents for that bundle of 100 papers. And that's where we are. Now this strike began in July of 1899. So July 18th in Long Island City, there was a, a journal delivery man, uh, that's the name of the newspaper journal, <laughs> the New York Journal. Uh, he sold these newsboys bundles with less than 100 papers. Well, the, the newsies were upset, of course. They were already outraged over the fact that their uh, newspapers weren't back to 50 cents. So they tipped over the wagon and they stole the papers. And, and then the next day on July 19th, in Manhattan City Hall Park, that's where a union formed. And they decided, these newsies decided that the price would be reduced. That was their demand that the price would be reduced back to 50 cents and that they were not going to buy the world, the New York world or the New York journal. And, you know, at first these newspaper tycoons or moguls or whichever word you want to use, they didn't take it seriously. I mean, these are street kids. <laughs> It's for a bunch of children. Who's going to listen to them? Uh, you know. So, um, I mean, you think about the the past strikes. It was just kind of a flash in the pan, really. I mean, nothing really happened out of that. And so, throughout the strike, a gentleman by the name of uh, Donald Seitz. Yeah, he was a real person. <laughs> There's a character in the movie named Seitz. He was an actual person. In, in fact, he wrote a book about Pulitzer. I think he wrote several books, but, um, but he kept Joe Pulitzer updated on the strike. And, and his first memo was like, yeah, nothing nothing of interest. I mean, they're out there doing their thing. But on July 22nd, Newsies stormed into the distribution center, which is, um, which is where they, of course, go in and they get their bundles and everything else. And in both the, the world and, and the New York Journal, 
they went in there and they threatened, they had clubs and everything. So here they are, they're using intimidation and violence. The police were able to remove the kids before anything really bad happened. However, on Columbus Circle, there were 500 kids and they were shouting, they were throwing fruit, and they stole a bunch of newspapers from wagons. So <laughs> the next memo that Sites sent, he, he, <laughs> he was more alarmed by what was going on. Uh, he, uh, he was like, uh, we, we might want to keep an eye out on these kids. Well, two days later, he was pretty panicked <laughs> in his next memo. I mean, the newspapers were abandoned, sales were dropping, and um, so, and, and he actually said something to the effect of, it's, it's a remarkable demonstration. And, uh, as the days continued, they were uh, they were pretty violent. I mean, they, they were beating up anyone who sold the boycotted papers of Pulitzer and Hearst. They threw water on uh, newspapers, like the newsstands and and that sort of thing, because you know when when they're wet, you can't sell them. And they tore up newspapers. There was a march across the Brooklyn Bridge. They actually uh, blocked the Brooklyn Bridge for, uh, an, uh, it didn't say exactly how long, but it sounded like it was for quite a few hours. And <laughs> there was a standoff between the newsies and the cops. <laughs> and then finally there was a rally on july 24th this is the one at new irving hall and it was sponsored by a politician and there were 5000 manhattan kids 2000 brooklyn kids and several hundred other kids from around the the city and the the entire night consisted of like speeches from a businessman and political figure so again like i said before a lot of times the businessmen and you know they would use these to their advantage so i'm sure that's what was going on here and then of course there were also speeches from the newsies uh such as uh kid blink dave simmons warhorse brennan uh jack uh tegan Bob the Indian, Crazy, our born Annie Kelly, she stepped up. And from what I remember, she was an older woman. She was considered like the mother. <laughs> and of course, Racetrack Higgins. And at the end, uh, uh, Kid Blink was rewarded with a flower horseshoe. But this was also the night where they had declared that there would be no more violence. So, um, given that, people were now in favor of the Newsies. I mean, after, after that whole thing, people were encouraging the news. They weren't even buying the newspapers anymore. Sites reported this to Pulitzer. He's like, we got a problem. <laughs> we got a huge problem here. <laughs> now, there were also supposed to be a parade right after the uh, rally but kid blink forgot to get the permits and so that didn't happen yeah kid blink being kid blink <laughs> now there was a snag you know you you you're reaching so you're so close and then there's a snag and so 
there was a rumor that went around that Kid Blink and Dave Simmons had betrayed the strike. And that basically they were given a bribe to sell the boycotted papers for either new clothes or money. It is, it's not known exactly what they were given in return. It could have been bribe money. It could have been new clothes. It could have been anything. But um, they denied the charges. But a few sources said that they saw a kid blink in, in nicer clothes. So it could have been money. It could have been the clothes. You just don't know. <laughs> Both of them resigned, and uh, Dave Simmons was then treasurer, and Kid Blink was the walking uh, delegate. So they didn't exactly leave the strike altogether. They were still there. But, um, however, there was an incident right after that where uh, a group of boys chased down Kid Blink because they were angry over the fact that, you know, angry over the rumors and everything. And there was an officer that saw these boys running through the streets and he just assumed that Kid Blink was uh, the leader of everything. <laughs> I'm sure Kid Blink had quite the reputation. <laughs> so he arrested Kid Blink for disorderly conduct and outside of the uh station were a bunch of newsboys out you know they were standing out there and they were jeering at him they were snapping at him and then all of so um now morale kind of dropped because of this there were others that tried to boost the morale of the newsies it was just the fact that kid blink and dave simmons somehow were able to keep their morale going Nobody had the, I don't know, the, the spark that they had. So yeah, they were starting to, to lose uh, faith. However, <laughs> eventually, despite what you see in the movie, Pulitzer and Hearst compromised. They just couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> they were losing a lot of money. <laughs> People were not buying the papers. They were favoring these kids. And something about how these kids had come together with their union and, and all of this and, and all of that was enough to have them side with the kids and not buy these papers. So, yeah, her, these, these two big shots in New York were, were losing money. So they, they came to a compromise. Keep the papers at 60 cents. However, Pulitzer and Hearst would buy back any unsold newspapers, which means that these kids would not have to sell late at night anymore. So, which is, was such an issue. There are a lot of pictures of little kids almost at midnight selling. Well, that wasn't gonna happen anymore because Pulitzer and Hearst had agreed that they were going to uh, sell, they were gonna buy back these papers. And um, so if the morning edition, they didn't sell after a certain time, once the next edition came, they were gonna buy those and, and so on and so forth. So the strike officially ended on August 2nd, 1899. So So just two months, <laughs> about a month and a half, really. Um, they started off with violence and then decided not to use violence. They lost their leader. And eventually, 
I mean, at first they weren't taken seriously at all. I mean, you think about it, these are kids as young as seven, maybe even five years old, going up against two of the most powerful men in New York City. And, <laughs> and well, they didn't get exactly what they wanted. I mean, this is as close as they were gonna get from. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, I think it's as much as a, of a win as you can imagine, considering. So those, that's, that's what happened during the strike. That's the real strike. And uh, the uh, Hollywood and, and the play took elements from that. <laughs> So anyway, on to the last part. So what exactly happened after the strike? I mean, did the dust settle a couple weeks later and everyone forgot until 1992? <laughs> Not exactly. No, this one left quite an impact. Uh, as I said earlier, with the Brooklyn strike and the Detroit strike and the Dallas strike, they were basically a flash in the pan. I mean, how many people really remember those strikes? Um, this one, however, because of the fact that a bunch of kids went up against Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst, these two men who were competing against each other. <laughs> and yeah, it, it left quite the impact. In fact, a gentleman by the name of Lewis Hine, in fact, I've been using his pictures throughout this video. We've seen them uh pictures of newsies of kids in coal mines of uh the children in the mills and just the the sweatshop kids and child labor and their families he decided that he was going to use his camera to protest child labor. Now he was doing this before the 1899 strike. He traveled all over America, took these pictures, and he would um, take the pictures to Congress and to the government and say, look what's happening. So he was one of the people that was protesting the fact that children were in the factories. And after the strike, he, I mean, he was at the, the front, at the forefront. And um, because there were a lot more people who were protesting child labor after the strike. It was like, these kids should not be working. They need an education. I mean, if they're smart enough to go up against these two big shots, they, they should get the proper education. <laughs> and the interesting thing about that is the children join the picket lines. 
and they there's pictures of them with signs that says we want we want to be in school we want uh, we we don't we don't want to work we want to be in school so but of course congress had to drag their feet and i cuz cuz that's what the government does <laughs> it stalled in the 20s and finally in the 30s child labor laws passed but man it took a lot of fighting you know people as, as far back as 1850s uh, people fighting, and, and you think of how long the Industrial Revolution was uh, going, you know, Andrew Carnegie and, and what he was doing, and of course you think of uh, the years of the, the whole progressive era, and, and that would be the whole thing with uh, building the Olympic, the Britannic, and the Titanic, and yeah, that was the age of progress, and, and of course, uh, just all of that passed these people were protesting the fact that children do not belong in factories they they should be having a childhood they should be getting the proper education and it took these kids who went up against pulitzer hearst for the light bulb to finally go off. I mean, Lewis Hine was showing off these pictures of children getting injured. Now, at that time, I mean, we, the, the pictures are pretty graphic. I mean, you see children missing fingers and they're, they're bandaged, but the, the children are missing fingers and 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 that sort of thing but and and just the injuries that they these are little children and he's showing these to to the politicians and and the politicians are just, oh, it's no big deal i i'm sure he was raging mad <laughs> and that's why he continued to take the pictures and that's why we have them today and he took more and more pictures to prove this shouldn't be a thing. This shouldn't be happening. And uh, he didn't take the pictures because, oh yeah, the, I need to document what life is like today. No, he, he was trying to make it stop. Well, it finally stopped. So finally in the 30s, <laughs> almost 100 years later, you think about it, it, just 20 years and then it would have been 100 years that people were protesting the living daylights out of kids just getting out of the factories. So uh, the Kid Blink and his group of newsies did inspire other newsies to go on strike. <laughs> um, but you know that that is going to happen. You know, you have someone who makes such an impact like that and other people are going to follow in their footsteps. It's not so much a copycat kind of a thing. It's just, like I said before, uh, like with uh, the newsies who were reading the newspaper, you know, Kid Blink and, and his group reading the newspapers, selling the newspapers, seeing the trolley strikes and, and the strikes, you know, like the Brooklyn strike and everything. They're reading that and they're saying, I could do that. What's stopping me from doing that, you know? So I'm sure it was the same kind of a deal. Now, this continued into the 20s. And as for the the trolley strikes, those went on into the 60s. I, I don't 
I, I, I said uh, to somebody that I, I can't stop thinking that they were saying, I, I hate electricity, you know, with all the, I mean, they had the, the trolleys overturned, they were gutting the trolleys, the stuff that they were putting on the tracks and everything. I mean, by the 60s, they should have been, they, they should have been fine with this whole thing and they should have resolved the matter. But they were still, it was like they had nothing better to do. <laughs> Anyway, so, but yeah, so Newsies were inspired by Kid Blink and his group of Newsies to go on strike. It, it's, it happens all the time. And uh, so that's nothing new. One thing that is interesting is, of course, as I said before, is that Newsies were used in advertisements, nonstop used for advertisements, they, uh, the politicians used them as well. And of course you had the, the charity dinners and all that. Well, after the strike, you saw them quite a bit in film. And I, I did bring that up, you saw them and they, they made a lot of film a, a lot of movies with newsies in them, uh, journalist movies, but of course there was also the movies with uh, newsies in them. Another thing is that when comic books became uh, popular, they had newsies in them. Of course, when you have uh, superheroes like Superman and Batman and those type, of course, <laughs> Superman with daily planet uh they they need the newsy to to stop by you know this this paper boy to <laughs> be there so they were showing up uh, a lot more and so in fact uh i did a, a video about uh this uh, thanhauser kid and she did quite a few movies for Thanhauser Company, where she was a, a newsie. Uh, the name they used quite a bit was Ragsy. <laughs> so, and, so, and, and into the 30s, you saw, and, and there was also radio shows where they used newsies. You heard like a extra, extra, read all about it. And I think a Green Hornet, the radio show for Green Hornet had a newsie start off every episode with, with a newsie saying that. So newsies weren't used for advertisements. They weren't used anymore. You know, politicians weren't using them. Uh, it wasn't for charity whatever's anymore they were actual people they were seen as actual people now and so in fact i i've seen quite a few uh of these uh, document films that started popping up in the 40s showing occupations and one of them was of a newsboy selling his newspapers and it followed him around so that tells me that they saw newsboys, a, a, a paper boy, as a occupation in, instead of just, you know, just a kind of scenery. <laughs> so unlike the other strikes before, like I said, a flash in the pan. This one left a major impact. It 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 changed a lot. I mean, it was basically. I think it helped start the groundwork for child labor. Took a while, but it did. <laughs> um. And finally, the Newsies were seen as people, finally. I mean, they weren't being used anymore 
even though they they liked their celebrity status before but now they were seen as actual people and they still had a celebrity status in a way i mean they were seen in movies and that's sort. there were other newsies there was a, a there was like a group of newsies they you know a uh, in early Hollywood, they would always have groups or duos, and as they had a, a group of newsies, and um, I think it was just the Newsboys, or they had a name before it. I don't remember exactly, but so, um, but that's what entertainment does. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, DC Comics had uh, what was called the Newsboy Legion in 1942. Uh, Jack Kirby and, uh, oh shoot, I'm blanking on his name. Uh, oh, what was it, what was it, what was it? Um, uh, Joe Simon and Jack Kirby. So they created this Newsboy Legion in 1942. Now, I've seen where it says that it was inspired by the 1899 strike, but I couldn't get any confirmation on that. I mean, considering that by the 40s, there had been so many strikes before that. So I, I, I don't know, but... Um, I mean, there's a couple characters in there that sound a lot like uh, Ed Higgins and Kid Blank, so uh, it, it's possible, but <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to confirm anything on that. So, I mean, It did leave an impact. It did die down eventually until 1992. <laughs> we all know that. But um, I think the great thing about the movie and then later the Broadway show is that we are remembering the history of it you know, that, that this actually happened. Um, and that these kids fought against two powerful men and that, that these kids, the struggles that they went through. I mean, we, we research it all the time. A lot of us do. Some of us just enjoy the movie or the Broadway show. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. But so it, they have left their mark in history, whether they knew it or not. I mean, I'm sure that when they were seven years old, they didn't even know what they were doing. They were just having fun tearing up papers. <laughs> <laughs> But as I've said, it, it, it left an impact. It eventually died down until 1992. And we're enjoying the movie and the Broadway show. And we've become somewhat historians of this event in history that could have gone forgotten if it hadn't been for for the movie so but anyway i want to thank you for watching 